pre-recorded lecture series. The idea behind the pre-recorded lecture series is that you have a short 45 minute to an hour lecture covering mostly the theory, covering the highlights of the chapter, but really emphasizing the theoretical and the models and the ideas so that when we go into a lecture environment, I'm able to ask questions of you, talk to examples and talk to a lot more of the practical aspects because you'll have some background grounding. You'll have either heard this lecture or read the chapter, prepared for the class. So this is the beginning of the flipped lecture series where your first encounter with me for the week is a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night where I start talking about the next chapter, the next lecture. Kicking off, this particular content that we're dealing to deal with, we're going to be talking about market research this week. Now market research is taught as a standalone separate subject at this university. We do have a range of market research societies in Australia, the most dominant being the um, Australian Marketing and Social Research Society with the wonderful short version of AMSRS, which I always pronounce as AMSERIUS. But this particular group overviews a lot of the marketing. They, are, they run some of the best research conferences you're going to be able to come across because it's real life marketing research companies, authors, writers, developers of research techniques getting together to swap war stories, tactics, techniques. Now for this chapter, the emphasis for you is to be looking at where the concepts of marketing research will fit into the way you see marketing, the way you think about marketing, and the way you operate. For an exercise like the marketing plan, there is a limited level of marketing research that we will call upon for you to do. But we're also, as we are asking you to undertake various reading discovery exercises over the course of the semester, when you're sent off by a, your textbook chapter questions to find a mission statement or review someone's public website or gather any form of data, basically you're off doing market research. So what you need to be considering is that even at this very early stage in the business, you need to start thinking about how the marketing information you're collecting is going to be used, how you're going to store it, particularly how you're going to store it. Because one of the things that you'll find is that you'll be able to, if this is the start of your marketing career, save, store, and collate the articles, the references, the knowledge you gain, and the artifacts that you gain in terms of PDF files downloaded and saved, to hang on to these and to build up a library. If you, at the end of your degree, and this is your last, this is a subject to close out before you exit, it's also worth just get, getting a sense for how would you pack together, collate, and keep your information. So they deal with the marketing information systems. Now this is where, from an American point of view, this is the processes. Uh, from the British point of view, these are the mechanisms that are used for identifying and anticipating. These are, in the American definition, the processes and sometimes the sort of the infrastructure aspect, that there's a marketing research system, an information system. The key things for you is that you want to be able to make a decision from the information you capture. Ultimately, all of marketing research is dedicated to informing a choice and making a decision. As we've emphasised in the course, marketing is a deliberate process. It's one where you have an objective that you have set for yourself and you take a series of informed, deliberate steps to get to that objective. Research helps you collate, collect, and get your gear together so that it is actually a useful 
It becomes a useful tool when you rely on it, when you use it. So I want to talk about the types of market research data that can exist. Uh, the key here for you in terms of understanding and using this knowledge at this point in the semester is that information from within the company, the internal company data, if you are working for an organisation, if you're going to do a marketing plan that is based on the company that you work with, then you've got the opportunity to access this private information. If you're working in the public sector, governments are uh, in some of the social or non-profit, some of these things like the marketing campaign results are actually public information. They're published as part of reports. If you take the time to dig up a few annual reports for the corporations you're interested in, you'll find that they have details of marketing spend, they've got their balance sheet, so you can start seeing financial returns, you can start unpacking some of this information about your competitors, but ultimately internal company data resides with you. So, if you are not dealing with a company and you're not you're doing your own product, you may not have some of this information to hand, you may have to either assume it exists, or know that this is the sort of thing you'd start collecting once you brought your particular product to the market. Of the elements that are probably most critical in here, customer complaints and feedback from sales staff are a very interesting protocol. We talk about them a little more in services marketing down the line. But what marketers can gain in terms of insight, knowledge, and recovery is if they can hear from the customer directly. Now usually, if your product's working well, you don't hear, or hear that much from your customer because, well, they're satisfied. Complaining voices tend to be louder because you've got a motivation to say, hey, this is broken, versus saying, hey, congratulations, it's working. So I very rarely, if ever, get emails from students saying, hey, the DLD lecture recorded just fine, thanks. I usually get if it doesn't. So you're more likely to get data out of a complaint than you are from someone who's satisfied or the product's doing the right thing. The customer history aspects, this is also a little bit of database mining. But ultimately, again, all of this is raw data. Data becomes information as you start to process it and translate it, but it only really becomes valuable once you start being able to use it to make the next decision. So, marketing intelligence, for you here, the thing that you're looking at is you're being taught over the course of this subject how to do marketing intelligence. You are being shown various techniques, some directly, some uh, indirectly. When we ask you to run a Google search or we go and get you to look at a rival company, that is part of the intelligence gathering. It sounds all cloak and dagger. Uh, some of the things you probably should be aware of is that the marketing in the 1950s when a lot of the market research stuff got really picked up a notch we had a lot of ex-army, ex-military people come across to join marketing because market distribution channels, people who had been keeping fighting forces supplied with ammunition, food and fuel, turned out to be really good at distribution and logistics, so they tended to move into marketing post-wars. So we should get an uptake of uh, post-Gulf War marketers. But what they're looking at here was, and the way it's sort of frame is intelligence gathering has that quasi militaristic aspect to it. What you have is direct observation and indirect observation. You have the ability to pull down information from people who've already provided, who've gathered this. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics, New Zealand Bureau of Statistics, or any other national Bureau of Statistics has a huge amount of data, huge amount of interesting information about the demographics, geographics, and just the world. The, that's the indirect approach. The suppliers, if you're in an industry, you'll find that there are trade magazines that are just dedicated to your industry. 
One of the most amazing things about the world is the number of, of magazines that exist for very specific purpose, transactions and trading. If you're ever really curious about how diverse the world is, get a copy of the writer's yearbook and look up magazines to see that you, what you can actually publish in terms of a specialist magazine. But those trade magazines contain a huge amount of data. You usually have access to the Moscow Human the University through a few different outlets. Some of our databases pick them up, some on the show up on Google. The internet, I keep mentioning Google because one of the things about the internet is you can track automated searches on your brand or on a rival's brand. If you're using Google, look up the Google Alerts and get to see how you can have the world's largest search engine hunt down information in almost real time and send it directly to you. Newspapers, that quaint old thing when uh, media was actually useful, but again, any form of news media that will now include opinion columns, blogs, uh, probably Facebook pages eventually now, but effectively content where people are writing up that you can go and analyse and look for trends and patterns. And finally, observation industry shoppers. Now, this is the fun part. Mystery shopping is where you actually send someone into your store to go through the transaction process, to go through buy some stuff from your store or your operation, to find out what actually takes place and whether it matches up to what you said was going to take place. Uh, just like I say, a big hello and shout out to the mystery shopping student who's in this course. It's always nice to have one. Uh, it's quite a frequently used process in universities is to send someone in to make certain that what you're asking, particularly things like the enrollment process where you go through, to make certain also things actually function the way they're supposed to. Now, with the automated electronic online systems, it's a lot easier to test these things without having to use a mystery shopper. But when it's something as variable as a lecture series, you really do have to put someone, feet on the ground, go in and experience the process. Now, the formal definition of market research, collect, analyze, interpret. Yeah, I know, another mastery. I like breaking marketing down into short catchphrases, into quick slogans, because those slogans are ways to help you frame thinking to make certain that you're covering your bases, you're getting your bases right. So research, it has a goal, and its goal is improve marketing effectiveness. Which is specific. How does it go about doing it? It collects, it analyzes, it interprets. What does it target? Customers, competitors, business environments. So these are, at any point in time, you are eyeing off a marketplace, and as a marketer, one of the things you find is you get this mindset where you, it doesn't switch off. You're in a shop, you go to a new area, you go to a new shopping environment, you start scanning the aisles, looking to okay, what products are on sale here, what's the price, what's, how's the store laid out, where are the parts. It becomes a second nature. But it's a taught behaviour and it's a learnt behaviour. An observational gathering of data is a specific technique that you will acquire over time. But the key to all of this is you're trying to answer a question. You're trying to solve a problem, or you're trying to know more about the market you're operating in than your opponent does. So, in the middle of this, we have the marketing decision support systems. You don't have one of these, but you're still going to make marketing decisions. Effectively, we've got data that sits on one side of the fence, we've got statistical and modeling software, just as a brief cameo appearance, the SPSS software uh, is present in all the lab computers. You do use it in market research and you will get to see a demo of a little bit of data being played with uh, during the lecture. But basically what you deal with here is everything needs to be processed. Every piece of 
data that comes in is raw, without processing, without being put through something, some filter, either statistical analysis, qualitative analysis, business analysis, or some way of fitting the raw data to the problem to see if there's a solution present, you always need to run some analysis. And that output of that analysis is information. Also, your ultimate game plan is take your parts, turn into answers, act on those answers, make informed decisions. So how does market research work? Well, this is the thumb bit. There are seven steps, and there are a couple of caveats on the seven steps. We're going to go through each at a time, point by point. But when we say data, it's very important very early to get you to start to think of data as both words and numbers. Or more than words and numbers. Visual images, sounds, designs. Marketing is not just a numerical outcome. Market research is not just statistical. Your own personal experience, some of the best market research you can ever do, is going to be using your competitor's product and trying to interpret your own feelings and your own reactions to this product so that you can understand it and reverse engineer what the product does as what's the core offering this product does. And that can't be necessarily dealt with in numbers, but it is data that can be turned into information that can be turned into a decision. Now, in the, in the steps, the research problem, first and foremost, is you may be recognizing a little pattern here. Because of the deliberate nature of marketing, the smart objectives actually surface as a cameo appearance here. In market research, you want to specify. What is it you want to achieve by doing the research? What's the question you're trying to answer? You then focus. You narrow down who it is, who you want to deal with, because marketing is about dealing with specific customer groups. And segmentation, which is the division of a larger market into smaller markets and smaller markets that are likely to be proactive and positively inclined towards your products. Research is about making certain that you deal with the specifics, that you get to the narrow to the nitty gritty early. So you are looking at this so from the point of view of what you want to achieve was the problem you're trying to solve, who, what, or where do you need to go to address this problem? Who do you need to talk to, or what do you need to sample, or what do you need to address? But then you also want to make certain that you keep the problem in a context. So your question is, you want to understand what motivates people to buy your competitor's product, Population of interest are owners of your rival product. But the context is, are you planning on expanding into that market? Is that market coming across? Is there a threat from your competitor? Why do you need to know this information? What's the, what's the, bigger, what's the bigger play here? Do you want a growth model? To come, do you want the answers to help you work out a growth model? Or do you want the answers to help you work out a defensive model? So, Again, there's a lot of thinking, there's a lot of aspects to this. But you also find that as you're developing something like a research plan, you will have excess notes. You'll have ideas that you don't use at various stages. So keep your notes. Put them to one side. You may find that as you progress down the particular project, that it suddenly becomes, hey, that's a really useful thing that I need to refer to where once you've got it, so at this initial point is you go through and say you've got four or five different consumer populations of interest. Keep your notes on all four, focus on the first one, 
If that doesn't resolve the problem, come back to your notes and go to the second, third or fourth consumer group. But always make certain that you retain that particular set of information to the why it is you're chasing, what it is you're doing, hang on to those notes. All right, stage two, the research design. Research designs are really come, uh, potentially really complex. This is intro, this is a single lecture. We spend a week on research designs alone in market research because, well, they're actually quite detailed. So here, this is your brief gloss over overview. A design will say what you're gonna do, where you're gonna go, how you're gonna do it, who's of interest, and how it's gonna work out. The question will be whether you want primary data and secondary data, or just secondary data. You will rarely ever find yourself in a situation where all you want is primary, because primary is expensive, difficult, awkward, and should be your device of last resort, because you should only bring it to play when you need to know a very specific answer to a very exact question. You shouldn't automatically go, hey, I've got a marketing problem I need to solve, I better run out a survey and collect some primary data. That should be your last step. You should, to a certain extent, be reluctant to go to primary because primary is difficult and if you can solve your problem with secondary data, it's cheaper, faster and better. This message has been brought to you by the people for less surveys, more reading the existing material. Now, in the research design, there are secondary research, internal sources and external sources. You might notice familiar path here again. The thing with secondary research is that, again, it's a learned behaviour, it's a trained skill, it's one of the skills we're teaching you to do this semester. We're going to give you plenty of experience in secondary research because you will be sent off to look things up in journal articles, search things on Google Scholar, check out Wikipedia, read blogs, read the textbook, read PDF files. All of these are training exercises. The ability to go, I have a problem, I wish to find what is known about this problem in the world, either through books, the internet, or other combinations of sources, I wish, I, can I answer my problem through these mechanisms? If I can, done. I don't need to go any further. So you can actually get through market research design with a straight secondary data, job done, answer the problem. Now primary research, this is, this is the glamorous end of marketing research. This is where you go out and you do stuff. Uh, if you hang around, for those of you doing a marketing major and go on to do honours, you will do primary research in your honours degree. If you hang around for longer after that, you'll do primary research in your PhD or your Masters by Research. But basically, primary research is something that is a specialist skill. We deal with it uh, in the latter courses and you won't be required to do it in an introductory course. I'm not going to ask you to go out and grab data because that's awkward. On the other hand, you would have noticed that I have already used primary research on you. The form that was handed out in the first week of classes was a primary research data collection tool to give me a series of specific answers to very specific questions. I told you I was going to use marketing on you, and I have. Now, in primary research, we break it down into three different groups. You need to, for the purposes of this exercise, this semester, be conversant with what the three groups do. But you're not going to be required to either go off and do this, nor for that matter is it one of these things where I'm going to be terribly fast if you don't mention it in a marketing plan or the exam. This is, if you are conversant with the yellow, we probably need some of this information and you can make use of it at some point, that would be great, but don't get too fussed about it. Exploratory research basically is looking for insight and understanding into the way we think. 
It focuses very much on the individual, on the consumer. There's a lot of psychological processes, a lot of stuff you need to learn from consumer behavior to be useful at it. And it does also use a lot of qualitative data, a lot of words, written materials. When you're starting to look at things like um, interview and some projective techniques, interviews you're familiar with, the sit down, ask a set of questions, how do you feel about this product? The respondent comes up with a bunch of answers, you transcribe those, you write them down, and then you go look at the common themes, similar words, you go look at this combination of information. Compare that to say, the, uh, the laboratory studies where you set up a series of different conditions and then you change one or two different aspects of the condition. So everybody comes in to watch a TV show. We show, we divide the group up into four groups. We show group A, B, C, different ads. And group D gets no adverts. What we then do is we measure the responses between A, B, C, and D, and how they are responding to the TV show, how they respond to the ads. D is used, the TV show only group is used to see whether there are any responses to the show itself. So that maybe the reason why everyone's really agitated and angry in the fourth ad block is in fact the TV show has antagonized the viewer. So that it's not actually anything the ads did, it's the TV, it's the TV show they're embedded in. So these are your experiments, your lab stuff. There's some interesting things there, but again, it's beyond what I'm expecting you to have to deal with this season, this semester. Now, this auditory research is the stuff that might be of use to you, uh, insofar as it's usually qualitative. It's usually about trying to do the groundwork prior to a larger study, getting involved in something bigger. What tends to happen is that you'll be looking at this from the point of view of how do we solve a problem so that we can actually then go off and do a more detailed mathematical, numerical, statistical analysis as a sequel. So if you do something like asking people what they feel, say, how do they feel towards exams, you do a couple of seasons of asking them how exams are, you know, what their preferences are for exam structures. Uh, then you get a sort of sense for the type of options that you should present to a group of people. And when you've got that sense, you can ask a question like, would you like it to be an open book exam or a closed book exam, knowing that those are the two major binaries that people go for. You could also ask them questions about uh, whether they want it to be a seen exam, unseen exam, all sorts of things. Once you find out the combinations of issues that are important, and you do that with the exploratory. That's your lead up that lets you go off and engage in the further analysis, the numerical analysis. Now, of the exploratory research, here's what I want you to do with this list and this set of ideas. One, use it if it helps answering a question. That's obviously the first thing. But two, in your marketing plan, there will be a section where you get to briefly talk to the sort of market research that you want to do, that you want to suggest gets done. This is a useful thing. This checklist of options and types of exploratory research it's a neat little place to pick up a quick citation to go and say, well, in the purpose of, for the purposes of this plan, the sort of research that would be useful to gain the insights that we're looking for is, and use the appropriate one for this. Now, if you're looking at having a reasonably large, this is kind of a, the ironic moment of market research, if you have a large budget, you can afford to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews because they are expensive, time-consuming, and take a bit of a bit costly to go and code, transcribe, and deal with. If you have a very small budget, you quite often find yourself doing consumer interviews in the one-on-one -on -one because you are going out talking to people directly and taking notes. 
The focus group is the kind of like the catch all, if in doubt, run a focus group uh, in the industry. They've got their role, but they're a little overused uh, and they're a little bit regarded uh, negatively at the moment, particularly as we're coming into election season. You'll see a lot of majorities about, oh, this is just focus group driven policy. The idea of a focus group is to get 12, 10 to 12 people in a room and get them to discuss something and you track their opinions, you track the group's thinking, but you also track the group's dynamic and interaction. Strictly speaking, tutorials are not focus groups because they're too damn large. There's 25 of you in a group, a tutorial usually, so tutorials don't count as focus groups. Case studies are a different beast, they're very qualitative, very much data is coming from existing documents. Uh, occasionally they'll be interviews to support, but mostly it's existing information, existing documentation. Analyze to look for themes, patterns, and other items of interest. Ethnography is fabulous and fascinating. If you ever get a chance to go up and work, uh, go across to say sociology, uh, they've got a lot of there's a lot of good skills you can get from sociology that will help you as a market researcher if you want to go down the ethnography path. Ethnographies are observational. You go in, you become part of a community and you take notes and you document in detail what's going on. It takes a certain mindset, it takes a certain brain type to be able to balance the ideas and keep the notes and do everything required, but the data you can get from an ethnography is incredibly detailed and frequently produces amazing insights. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of value to this work. It's also exceptionally time consuming and rather expensive. If you go and live in a community for six to twelve months to get this to do this right, you're going to take some time. The projection techniques, uh, when you come across these, they kind of they feel kind of weird because you ask people about what their friends would do. Like you ask people questions like if Pepsi Max if cold drinks were a brand, you know, were people at a party, where would brand Pepsi Max be found? It's like, seriously, who, who sits there and thinks, wow, you know, if my soft drink was at a party, where would I find my soft drink? It's like, the first thing is, as consumers, if we walk into a, a party full of soft drinks, those soft drinks are going to scream and run because we are the most terrifying thing because we have consumed their kin and their families. And secondly, if we walk into a party full of giant cans of soft drinks, we probably also want to check out bottle whatever we just drunk for whether it was spiked. Now, so that was exploratory. This is descriptive. Descriptive is a really I did a bit of descriptive um, on you. This is basically your first wave of numbers. This is where you're going to go and do counts of the what is going on. The previous rounds of research tend to focus on the why things are going on, but this is very much the what. This is the how many people are in a room, how many people bought our product last week. Sales figures are descriptive. Attendance records are descriptive, ground attendance numbers, there's a whole bunch of numbers that we collect in the world that are simply descriptive and that's brilliant because sometimes the only thing you need is to be able to say what happened. There were 79 students at the exam, we have an enrollment of 122, we seem to be missing some students, that's the what. If we, the why you would answer that question would be the, this was a voluntary exam. So, in descriptive, you're also uh, usually answering very specific questions. And, again, this is when you go back to your research design and your research outcomes, is to say, what is it I want to know? I want to know how many things do we have in the warehouse? Descriptive. If you want to know why they're still in the warehouse and nobody's bought them, you're wanting to head into the why, you're probably looking for causal or exploratory. Now causal research, this is where we start heading down to quasi to actual scientific. 
And this is what a lot of marketing actually is. Marketing operates as an ongoing research and experiment. So does higher education do? You might notice this as we roll the semester out. In causal research, you change one factor. You modify something. And you look to see what that impact is. You make your modification because you've got a theory. You've got an idea. Here's what you think is going to happen as a consequence. So if you look at marketing as a causal event, we go, if we show this advertisement on television in a primetime TV show with a phone number for people to call, when the ad is shown, there should be an uptake in phone calls to our hotline. If that takes place, success. Intervention has worked. The next part of the causal research is they go, well, are they more likely to call us if it's 1-800 and a set of letters, 1-800 call now, versus, say, letters and numbers, so 1-800 call now versus 1-800-222-55669. Yes, I had to read the phone to actually figure that one out. But basically, the question on this is, will changing one factor influence something else? So we do this on a big scale, we do this on the, if we change the packet size, if we change the, pack, the price, if we change the distribution channel. All of marketing has that, sort of, that certain causal event to it. You also notice that I'm going to, I'm asking people to do an assessment task and then I give them feedback. And when I give you feedback on your assessment task, I am trying to change a variable, a couple of variables, and I will see how successful that change in variable is by how well you do your next task. So there's a bit of this stuff, of course, and affect things going on. What is it that we can offer you to motivate you to do well in this course that helps you learn? How does it function? Okay. Step three in your marketing process. This is a question of collecting primary data if you need to. So they emphasize, I frequently emphasize, you don't always need to go to primary. They don't always need to collect. Once you, but the, for the purpose of the exercise, we're going to assume that you are going down that path and you do need to do it. So what you start with is you need an approach. And we spent about four to five weeks talking over the different ways you can collect primary data in the market research subject. So again, this is a real gloss over the surface, real summary, real skim. There's a lot more depth. And even when we're doing this, when we spend a week talking about uh, structured analysis, we really want to spend a month doing that. So the question is one of structured or unstructured. Structured basically is how deliberate are you going to be in your approach? If you're doing surveys, questionnaires, experiments, quantitative, it's usually easier to make something structured because of the nature of the beast. If you're doing, say, observation, ethnography, where it's a lot it's going to be chasing opportunities as they arise, it's probably going to be the other end. In data, there are questions, there are very important questions that you ask yourself, and that is, will the data I collect be valid? And that is, will it actually measure what it's intended to measure? And this is a really critical question, because if you are, you can measure anything, but does that anything you're measuring actually answer the question you're setting out to ask? And that is the probably the most critical thing in market research thinking is 
Yes, I've got a set of numbers, but do the numbers actually address the problem I'm trying to solve? The second element we're talking to is the reliability. How likely is it that if we went out and collected this data again on a similar group of people, we would get similar results because the results are the consequence of the mechanism and the question you're asking and they're not just actually occurring by chance and accident. Reliability is really the big one for a lot of the market research where it's going to be using some difficult techniques, mathematical techniques or uh, playing around to be able to say, look, we do this, we run this experiment twice, we will get roughly comparable results both times. If you can't do that, then it's neither valid nor reliable. And the marketing question, the ultimate marketing question for us is, is the sample we're using, as the infinite, where the source of our information, be it people, objects of under observation, books being analysed, text being used, Will the data that we gather from this source actually reflect the larger market that we are addressing? And this is one of the places that you can make an absolute critical error. This is where you can have the epic fail, of all epic fails, also known as New Coke. Because if your data that you are using is not representative of your market, your decision will be wrong. Now the new Coke case scenario, which is a very old, old event, it predated my time in this business. And this was a case study we were taught as a cautionary tale as young marketers. New Coca-Cola was a change in the formula of the class, well, what was now referred to as the classic Coca-Cola. Coke had been suffering a set of fail, set flagging sales. They weren't doing so well in the summer season. So they went out and they asked a bunch of people what was wrong. Why, why weren't you drinking Coke? Remember, this is the company that wants to be the number one beverage in the world. And they were finding themselves, you know, people were drinking other things. So they asked people, you know, what was it? What was the problem? And a group of respondents came back and said, look, it's the flavour. So they went out, they developed a new flavour, they developed a new formula, and then they put it out, tested it, and a whole bunch of people liked the new formula, liked the new flavour, it was great. The problem which they then encountered, and they didn't realise at the time, was they weren't asking people who drank the current Coca-Cola if they liked the new formula. They were asking people who didn't consume their current product, would you buy this new product? without checking to the with the people who are currently buying the product whether they wanted that. So the sample that they chose was not representative of their audience. Their core primary audiences were horrified when the flavour changed and the taste changed and it turned out that most of the people who didn't like the taste of Coke were going to buy Coke anyway because they didn't like the taste of Coke. And calling it new Coke didn't make any difference. All it did was put off the old Coke drinkers. Classic drinkers. And all of this came back to the representative of, representativeness of the data set. They asked the wrong people the right questions. And that's the absolutely the important thing here is that nothing else in the process was wrong. If you ask the wrong group of people the right questions, you will get bad data. If you ask the right group of people the wrong questions, you'll get bad data. But you're far more likely to get devastatingly bad data when it's the right questions because everything else will line up. It's valid, it's reliable, but it's just the wrong group to ask. Alright, sample. This is for, in the terms of who to ask. Now, because we're a little consumer behaviour focused in this subject, I talk to sample in terms of people. But sampling also takes place in terms of populations can be any group or any series of things that you want to analyse. 
I happen to be in possession of every issue of the Australian, the Australasian Marketing Journal. I have every single paper written for that journal. That gives me about 300 to 500, I can't remember the exact number, I think it's about 300 papers. I also happen to have every paper ever presented at the Australian New Zealand Marketing Academy Conference and that's something to the tune of 1,500 papers. Now, what a sample does is a sample lets me, instead of having to go through all 1,500 papers, which is the population, I can pick out a smaller number based on either probability or non probability. If I use probability, there's a series of equations, maths, and tricks that lets me say the number of papers that I chose to analyze is reflective of the overall total population. Sampling is absolutely vital because you can't usually afford to ask everybody who's in the population of interest what they feel. You can't usually also get everybody in the population of interest. And there is some theory that says that it's actually a really bad idea. But that's what the labor market research class is to tell you about. So in the probability sample, there is a equal chance there's a set of random allocations. In the non-probability, there's a set of judgments. In non-probability, it's things like, I pick a student in my tutorial, then ask them to recommend to me three other students in the subject for, the, for filling out my survey. I just get those three students and then get them to recommend three more. What you have then is, there is no random chance that everyone on the subject could equally be picked, but you have a very deliberate process, it's called snowball sampling, or network analysis, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, I can tell from student A, they've given me student two, three, and four. Student two gives me X, Y, and Z. Student three gives me the possibility that student three could then go and say, well, Z, A, and B, and student four goes, Z, A, Z, Q, and R. I know that Z is kind of popular and should be one of the people I should go back and ask next time. So there's a bit of analysis you can do off the non probabilities, but there's no random chance, there's no equal chance. The biggest thing for you in marketing is that sampling is a form of market selection, it's a form of segmentation, it's a form of thinking about how do I find a smaller group of people to represent my larger market so that I can test my ideas out on them and work from that knowledge. So the samplings, these are, as I said, talk through most of them. Again, this one, seriously, read it up. Uh, the key, again, is that I'm not necessarily going to ask you to, well, I know for certain I'm not asking you to collect data so you won't have to address samples. But it's one of those things that if you filled it through when you're writing up your marketing plan, it will show that the thinking, the, that we're going to do our market research this way, we're going to use this sort of approach because we're a large multi, we're representing a large multinational corporation, we can afford a large probability sample. But if you're doing something like uh, a word of mouth job finding network, you probably would actually want to use non-probability sampling and do things that allows you to get network analysis going as part of or get a sense for how people connect to other people. Alright, step five. In a market research approach, step five is get out and get it on. Do it. These first five steps also really link up to doing an assignment. This is where you go, step one, what, are, what is the question? Down to step five, go out and do the research. Go out and actually collect the information you need. Read the article, not just print it out. It's really annoying when you download a file, you print out a file, you think, I've done something. You haven't until you've read it. We're not at that point where we can just download files to our heads. Yeah, Google's working on it. But at the same time, if Google can download files to your heads, 
the same technology will allow Facebook to upload directly from your memories. And there's stuff in there you really don't want sharing on the internet. And not even about that that you just talked about, I was thinking more about your taste in uh, TV shows and music that you really don't need to anybody, but there's no way you're changing the channel when that show comes on. If you're in private. Alright, so collect the data mode. Get out, get it on, get it done. Step six is an analysis and interpretation. Okay, step six is critical to you this semester. You are going to have a lot of ideas thrown at you. You're going to have a lot of material dumped on your lap, put out in front of you. You've got to then be able to use the knowledge. You've got to be able to turn it around from, I have data, convert it to information, make it happen as knowledge, and then result in wisdom. Now the wisdom aspect is a bit you write up. So here's how it works. This is, I love this sort of model, and you'll get this model thrown at you frequently. Data is the raw material. Data is the material as it exists in the textbook. And this is why I'm going to tell you now, on this set of slides, why I don't believe in using direct quotes in marketing assignments. Because direct quotes are raw facts, they're just data. That's not the answer. Nothing exists that can simply be copied and pasted from another source into your assignment to make your answer meaningful. You have to put your own effort in. You have to give a little of you. You have to turn that raw quote, or that raw line, that raw sentence, that raw piece of information, so that raw piece of data, turn it into information. This is where you get some context to it. This is where you start to looking at an answer, a question and saying, okay, Question asks me to break the market up into six segments. Raw data says, segmentation theory says that there are multiple different ways of segmenting a market. Here is a definition of segmentation. Here are the definition of the segments. And it's data. The question asks you, what is the best segment that could be used? Then you turn that data of, here's my list of segments, you go off and you try using each segment. You put some context to the segments and then it start, starts to become information. When you write it up for submission, you go and say, the best segmentation allows for six different approaches, citation. Of these approaches, the primary segment that will be the best segment for use is X. Reference. This has been applied because of Y reason. You have gone from taking a raw list of here are segments that can be done and created knowledge. You've created something. And this is what we're trying to train you to do, is to get to that creation stage. Don't drop direct quotes in because direct quotes are artless and they're just data dumps. They don't do anything valuable for you. Knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the acting on that information. Knowledge is answering the question using the insights from the work that you've read. Wisdom may not necessarily be able to be demonstrated in your assessment task, but wisdom will probably show up in the exam when you know how to answer, what to answer, and why to answer. All right, the final stage on research is the documentation. Now, for the purposes of all market research, market research is a means, it is a mechanism. The report is the end. You will see this throughout a lot of marketing. Marketing as a process, marketing as a behavior, as a verb, as an activity, which is the US style. This is where you undertake, where you document it and you report it and you write it up in a research report. You document a SWOT analysis, you document an internal and external analysis in the SWOT analysis 
reporting style or the pest analysis reporting style. You document these things in marketing plans, but the critical aspect was the planning and the implementation, the documenting, which you're going to get some practice of doing, is in a later subject, it will be the research report, in this subject it will be the marketing plan. But the critical aspect here is that you will frequently find yourself in possession of more knowledge than you can document. The report itself answers the question directly, but if you found interesting and new things, note it down, store the information, tag it, archive it, and be able to come back to it later. There's a lot that happens in marketing where you learn something, you discover something, or you think something up, that you have to come back to later because suddenly context change and becomes useful. So be, be mindful of that, keep your notes, keep your notes organized. Alright, that's the pre record for this week. Your move from here is read the chapter again, work on that case study, get your drafts in, get ready to submit them, be on time, do not be late, late is bad, late is going to make you feel terrible about yourself and your life choices, don't be late, this is no reverse psychology. You have a week. Do not tell me that it went to hell in the handbasket on Tuesday night of this mission night because I will not be sympathetic. Be early. Do not be late. Being late, late, late for an important date would be a terror. Terror. Terror thing to have.